from America. He was born to parents who had just become Christians through the Billy Graham crusade, and he was raised in a Baptist family and was dedicated to Jesus. And prior to 1994, neither Steve nor Janet, his wife, had ever set foot in a Catholic church. And after studying many books to convince their best friend and recent convert, Al Cresta, that the early church was evangelical, Steve and Janet backed their way right into the Catholic church. So Steve, uh, he began writing a letter to his father explaining why he became Catholic. And this letter soon became the book and a best-selling book, Crossing the Tiber. And since then, Steve's passion and depth for the truth found within the Catholic tradition has led him walk um, away from his business and pursue what he really loves, which is writing. And he writes many books and Bible studies. He uh, speaking, producing Catholic films and leading pilgrimages to the biblical lands and other holy locations across the world. And Steve and Janet, uh, they've been to the Holy Land probably about 200 times or so. But uh, who's counting uh, filming and leading thousands of pilgrimages across the world. And Steve, a regular guest on radio and television, uh, including Catholic Answers of a Maria Relevant Radio EW10. And I suppose now we can add Radio Maria to that list. So mm -hmm. welcome, uh, Steve. Thanks very much. Uh, welcome to Ireland, virtually at least. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry I have a funny accent um, from being over here on the other side of the pond, but uh, I'll try to speak clearly, even though I have a funny accent. Oh, um, I'm happy to join you. Uh, you told us a lot of the things that I've done, but I want to show you what I'm most proud of. I think, can you see that? For anyone who can't see, uh, that's a picture of your family. It's a, a large family. Yep. And that, that's what I'm proudest of. That picture was taken in January. We uh, came into the Catholic Church. There were six of us, my wife and I and our four kids. Now we're 29 strong, and we have 19 grandchildren. So that's what I'm proudest of. And they're all good Catholics. They love the Lord. They all homeschool because we don't trust the public schools over here anymore. And um, But anyway, I, I wanted to... Uh, fulfill your request to give a little bit of background and what it was like for the Holy Family to live. For 20 minutes, we'll do that. And then we'll talk a little bit about Mary. What, and one of the things I like to do is take you to the place where it actually happened. My favorite place to do these talks is not here in front of a Zoom camera in my living room in Michigan. My favorite place to give these talks is in Nazareth. I've given this talk that I'm gonna share right now with you. It's normally an hour long. We're gonna do it in 20 minutes on uh, a day in the life of the Holy Family. And my favorite place to do that, of course, is standing right at the place where they lived in front of the cave that the Holy Family lived in for 30 years in Nazareth. And I've gotten, I feel, to know Mary and Jesus and Joseph a bit. I've, I've made movies. I, I don't know if you're familiar with these, but I, I made a documentary movie on Jesus and Mary and also uh, seven other ones, uh, including Abraham, Moses, and so on. But they're all filmed on location to give you a sense of it. And one of the things about the Holy Family that I like to help people understand is that they think they live like us, that they look like us, that they walk three feet off the ground, so to speak. Uh, we often get an image of an unwounded, beautiful Jesus swooning on the cross. And I understand why art portrays him that way because it's trying to show the inner qualities and so on of Jesus that he's actually in control. But if you saw Mel Gibson's movie, you know that the crucifixes we see are very unrealistic. And in a way they do us a disservice because we don't see the real price that was paid for our sins. You also see many times Mary, who is perfectly manicured, like she just came out of the beauty parlor. And I'm going to probably um, do away with that myth as well. Mary was a real girl. And the talk that I give next is called Mary the Real Girl and the Woman of Mystery, Two Sides to One Coin. And you often see very effeminate Joseph with lotion soft hands carrying a flower around. And I don't like those kind of images of Joseph either because he was a very manly man. And I give another talk that's over an hour long called Joseph the Manly Man and the Chosen Father. And um, But what I wanna do now is take you to the actual place where they lived. And you're gonna have to work with me on this. I'm going to try to introduce you to the real 
Mary, Jesus, and Joseph and a day of their life. And I want to start out by just reading this little introduction, which will give you a sense of what we're going to do here in the matter of 20 or 40 minutes altogether. I want to take you on a journey I've been on over 180 times, a journey back to in time to the land of the Bible and walk in Jesus and Mary and Joseph's sandals from before sunup until sundown. So for the next 20 minutes, let's step back in time and enter another world. It's now 2,000 years ago on the other side of the planet. It's not a kingdom, it's a demo an, or a democracy. The language is, yeah, I'm sorry, it is a kingdom. It's an empire actually under Rome and it's not a democracy. The language is Aramaic, not English. There's no electricity, no porcelain toilets, no running water, electric shavers, grocery stores, cars or government assistance programs. You now live for the next 20 minutes in Nazareth, a small village of less than two acres in size with about 250 people with no main road running through the village. It's relatively unknown, never mentioned in the Old Testament. There's no main road and you and your neighbors live in caves carved into the hillside. People don't realize that the Holy Family lived in a cave. The only source of water is 15 minutes away. There's no main road. Oh, I'm sorry. You live a um, hundred miles from the temple in Jerusalem and you are required to walk there for the festivals and feasts like Passover, walking a hundred miles there and a hundred miles back. It's dark and cool in the cave before the sun rises in the morning. The alarm goes off, but it's not an iPhone. The alarm is your neighbor's rooster. There's rustling on the bed mats on the floor next to you. Clay oil lamps are set in the niches of the cave walls. Soon the dim flame sends a flickering glow, glow that dances on the walls of the cave. Looking up, you see the dark soot on the roof from many years of fires. The crackling of the cooking fires grow louder and the light increases because Mary has got up first and kicked up the coals in the fireplace back into flame as she prepares breakfast. You and Jesus yawn as you sit up from your mats on the floor with sore aching muscles from the hard work yesterday. You toss aside the sheep's wool that's kept you warm on the night overnight and another day begins. That's how I like to introduce what we're going to do now to see the whole life of the Holy Family. They did live in caves, by the way. Nazareth archeologists have found 25 caves that the people lived in during the time of Christ. And people always mention the Holy House of Loretto. Yes, there is that, but it is not a whole house. It is just portions of some walls. And the way that I see that is in front of the cave, Joseph built a facade or an entryway with a door into the cave. And that would be what the Holy House of Loretto would have been. Now, I like to ask this first question because I want you to get a sense of the real Holy Family and what it was really like to live then. So I like to ask everybody, and I do this at conferences, I do this in front of the cave, I said, what do you think the Holy Family did first thing every morning? And everybody say, they prayed. And I said, and then I say, is that what you do the first thing every morning? And then everybody chuckles and they say, well, I guess no, we go to the bathroom, we use the toilet. Well, it's so funny that nobody ever thinks of the Holy Family needing to go to the toilet and they didn't have toilets in their caves. They would have to leave the cave and go out into the trees or find a latrine or something to use for the toilet. And people are kind of shocked and they say, well, you can't talk about Mary that way. But I say, yes, I can, because Mary was not only the woman of mystery, the queen of heaven, the immaculate conception, Mary was also a real girl. And when she met that angel that morning, she was probably only 14 or 15 years old. So this was a real girl. I want to show you actually a picture. These are pictures that uh, came from Nazareth when cameras were first invented. This is before um, it was still, it was over a hundred years ago. Let me put it this way. And for those who can see, look at these girls. These are girls actually in Nazareth at the well that Mary went to. This is over a hundred years ago and not a lot changed. They're carrying 
water on jugs on their head. We'll talk more about that when I talk about Mary a little bit later. But they lived a very rustic lifestyle. And Mary, what her first job would have been every day is to go to the well. It was 15 minutes walk away. They would pray after using a facilities. And then Mary would give them breakfast. And the Jews had daily prayers that they did it. They prayed together, just like the, uh, the liturgy of the hours for the church today. And Mary would cook up breakfast, something very simple that would, they would, they didn't have meat like we know it. Meat was very expensive. And at most, it would just be small portions to flavor the food, but they'd have lentil, lentils and barley and maybe nuts. There's a lot of nuts over there, almonds and others, and pomegranate fruits and Probably they would use honey. They had eggs because even Jesus said, would you I not as a mother hen gather you? So they would have had eggs and just very simple fruit foods that Mary would prepare for them. And then they would send, she would send Jesus and Joseph off to work. Now, where would you work if you live in a village with 12, 25 caves? That's very rustic. There's not much work when you have only 25 caves. Anybody that runs a business knows that you need a customer base. You need a group of people, a customer base in order to be employed. So what I think and many scholars do and historians is that what Jesus and Joseph did every morning was get up and they walked one hour over the hills of Nazareth to a place called Sepphoris. During the life of Jesus, the Romans were building a huge city. And they weren't building it out of wood because there's not a lot of wood in this part of the country. There are quarries with Jerusalem limestone. And even to this day, when we drive around Nazareth and around Mount Tabor, the Transfiguration, and all through that area up north, you can see the quarries with trucks and hydraulic equipment bringing those big chunks of limestone out of the hillsides. Jesus and Joseph it are carpenters, but not the way we think of the word in English. The actual word in Greek is tekton, and it means one who works with hard materials like wood or stone or metal. In other words, they were day laborers. They would go out and work all day, grunts, so to speak. We call them here in the United States rednecks because they worked all day and the back of their neck was red by the time the day was over. And I've envisioned them being there chipping rocks, maybe quarrying them from the hillside and transporting these big rocks over to the building site of Sepphoris, or they were in charge of shaping the rocks to fit into the walls and as theater seats and into the buildings and the road that's made out of the same material. So I can see Jesus and Joseph from sunup to sundown. They would probably leave their cave before the sun came up. They would walk an hour. I know how far it is because I've run that way. I love to run and I've run from Nazareth to Sepphoris and back again. Think, I think I took probably the same route that they did, a trail there to see how and what it was like for them. And I like to think, what did Joseph and Jesus talk about as they walked along an hour to work and an hour back? Did Joseph teach Jesus or did Jesus teach Joseph? I think it probably went a little both ways, but Joseph as a father would be responsible, not the priest, not the school. There was no school there. The father was in charge of teaching his children. And by the way, fathers, that hasn't changed. You are still the primary teacher of your children. And like Joseph, that's your responsibility. Even if they go to school, you better make sure they're being taught correctly in school and correct what they're not being taught. But anyway, Joseph and Jesus would have walked that hour and probably arrived about the time the sun was coming up. And then they would be given a hammer and a chisel. I can just see this. And there, the rest of the day, ching, 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 shaping these rocks into the size of cubes that were needed to put into the walls of this bu uh, the buildings. And it's a, a major city. Now, just in um, January, February of last year, not 2020, our group was the last ones out of Israel before COVID shut the world down. We were there and I took my group to Sepphoris. And by the way, when we left the airport, we were the last group to leave and no groups came in. The doors were shut when we left. And we went to Sepphoris that day and I remember taking our group along and saying, see those rocks in the wall there? See those rocks? That's all first century in, this, in the theaters and in the buildings there. It's very likely or possible that Joseph and Jesus were the ones that chipped those rocks and shaped them, carried them over and put them into the wall. Now, you know, 
what kind of men they must have been. They were not like we see in pictures, like they just came from Sweden. Jesus with his beautiful blonde hair and Joseph all manicured and lovely with soft hands. If you would look at those guys, real guys, and here's a picture for those who are able to see. This is what I think Joseph really looked like. Joseph was a hard worker, walked around in bare feet like, the, like Mary did too. And he was a hard worker, rough and tough. I, I like to say at men's conferences that Joseph could have picked any one of you guys up and thrown you over a wall without even trying. These guys were bodies of iron, walking two hours a day back and forth to work, up and down hills, no less. It's not flat there. It's all hilly and uneven. And in the heat, it's over, it gets to be 100 degrees in Nazareth. And these guys, if you'd say, show me your hands, their hands would have been covered with calluses and wounds. I brought a rock one time back from Israel and I wanted to break it so I could give pieces of it to all my friends it's early on. And I put that big rock on my workbench and I took my hammer and I whacked that rock and instantly there was blood coming out of six different places in my hand as that rock splintered and hit my hand. You ask Jesus and Joseph to show you their hands, they would be rough and tough. They would be covered with calluses and wounds. Their faces were dark, dark eyes. They weren't Swedish and they were tough men. I like to say that Joseph had a, a fist of iron in a velvet glove, a righteous and generous and kind man, but also very strong, very masculine. I know today in the United States, I don't know about Ireland, but there's a lot of the feminism going around and they talk about toxic masculinity, that masculinity is toxic. It's something that we don't want. And I am totally opposed to that. Men should be masculine and women should be feminine. And Jesus and Joseph would have been great examples of pure, wonderful masculinity under the lordship of Jesus and of God the Father. Now they work all day and they probably get a break for some water and they packed a lunch, probably of things that Mary would have sent. What did these people travel with when they went to work? Well, we know that because out in the wilderness, when Jesus was teaching them, they were hungry. He found a boy with five small loaves and two fish. The fish came out of the Sea of Galilee. It was processed in, um, in Magdala. There was a big processing plant there and they would smoke the fish and dry it. And then that would be used when you're out working because it doesn't spoil. And the loaves are made out of barley. And I don't think they were big loaves like we know all sliced up, but they were probably just very coarse and very small loaves. And I think that's probably what Jesus and Joseph ate for lunch. And then they would work all afternoon and come back home again in the evening. Now, when they arrived back home, I like to give you the scene of Mary waiting at the entrance of the cave, waiting for her two guys to come home. She has been waiting excitedly for them all day. And she is waiting and see, and finally they crest the hill with all the other men, because probably all the men from Nazareth went to work there. So they crest the hill and they start coming down and Mary rushes back into the cave and she gets the dinner finally all set up. She gets the mats ready on the floor because she knows these guys are tired. They've been working 12 hours or more probably. And she rushes to get everything ready for them. She lives for these guys and they arrive home and there they have their meal prepared for them and they say their evening prayers. Again, go out and find the bushes or the latrine, however they did that back in those days. And then they would come into the cave and crash for the night and sleep on the floor again on their mats and then get up again the next day and do the whole thing over again. And this is what they did only six days a week though because God had given them a great blessing. When they were in Egypt, the children of Israel worked seven days without ever getting a day of rest, no holidays, no vacation days, no Sunday or Sabbath day off. They worked seven days a week from sunup to sundown without ever having time for family or prayer. They were driven and God, when he brought them out says, I'm going to give you the great gift. In fact, I'm going to even enforce it. I am better of a master than Pharaoh. I am going to enforce that you take one day off and I want you to rest and be with your family and worship God, worship me. And the Sabbath, that's what it was meant to be, is a great blessing for people who had been enslaved for 400 years, working seven days a week. And now God is giving them the blessing of working only six days and having the seventh day to enjoy the family, to sleep in in the morning and to teach the children and to go to prayer and worship. Now, Mary 
her life during the day would have been very difficult as well because they had to make their own clothing. They had to, um, she would have to go shopping. One of the things she'd have to do, and I'm going to save this more for the Mary talk, is go every morning and night at least that often to the well with the jug on her head and bring the water back because that's their only source of water. So you would use water much more conservatively back in those days than we do today where you just automatically think you're going to flip on the switch or you flip on uh, the bathtub and fill it up and the water is free and easy and plentiful. But back in those days, you had to go to the well and draw the water up out of the well. And you remember the story of the Samaritan woman that she came to the well at noon? That's not when people went to the well. The well would be visited early in the morning and later in the evening when it was cooler and it wasn't so hot. So the woman coming to the well at noon is an indication that probably she was shunned by the rest of the women because of her sinful lifestyle, having had four husbands and now living with one who's not her husband, which would have been very frowned upon with the Samaritans because they were very loyal to the first five books of the Bible, not the rest, but they were the Samaritans held to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they had uh, other writings too, but that would have been, they would have been very moral. And, and uh, that's why the woman came to the well at noon. I'm convinced of that. So Mary would have had all of the chores, getting food ready, preparing the food. Now, I want to just make a comment about food too. This might be shocking to some people, but I think that the Holy Family, along with other people there, ate grasshoppers and sparrows. And you say, well, that's disgusting. That's absolutely disgusting thinking of Mary and Joseph and Jesus eating grasshoppers and eating sparrows. Why would they do that? Well, first of all, in Leviticus 11.22, in the law, when they're given their kosher rules among the Israelite people, there's a lot of things they cannot eat. But sparrows are edible for them. And so are crickets, grasshoppers, and locusts, or any of those insects that have the back feet that boing, they jump with. Those are clean food. And what did John the Baptist eat when he was in the wilderness? And we think he's probably Jesus's cousin or a close relative of Jesus because of his association with Elizabeth and Mary. So the very fact that he ate grasshoppers and it was legal food to eat for Jews and they're plentiful in Israel. One day I was out with my group, by the way, and I was telling them this story and I made a joke. I said, if anybody catches a grasshopper, I'll eat it because I love living the Bible in the Holy Land. Well, these four smart alecks, they went out and they found a big four inch wiggly grasshopper and they brought him back to me and said, okay, right in front of the group. And they said, okay, Steve, you said you eat him. What are you going to do now? And my wife looked at me and she said, oh no, please don't do it. At least take his head off. Well, I told him I would, and I love living the Bible in the Holy Land. And I know it's disgusting, but I chucked the grasshopper and chewed him up and swallowed him. People say what it tastes like. It tastes like chicken. No. But the, the reality is, is that many parts of the world today in Asia and Africa, grasshoppers are a normal part of the diet because they are high in protein. Now, the sparrow, why that? Well, because even uh, today in kosher rules, the sparrow is kosher, clean food for Jews to eat. When they can't eat a lot of other birds, sparrows are acceptable. And remember, Jesus said, are not three sparrows sold for a penny? Why would anybody want to buy a sparrow? Why would the kids go out and, and snare and trap sparrows and sell them if it wasn't for food? They don't give much meat, but those little breast uh, muscles in the breast right here in the sparrow would be a nice flavor for a lentil stew or something else like that. But this was a very rustic place. You've got to realize this was, these were rustic people walking all the time, barefoot. They had flies buzzing around their head. They would usually have camel dung between their toes. And you say, that's disgusting. I've never seen a picture of Mary like that before. Well, the re reality is, is they traveled all the time in caravans. And what's up in the front of a caravan, but donkeys and camels. And oftentimes they'd be transporting sheep and things too. And I take my groups to ride camels in Israel all the time. And you don't realize the mess they make. And if you're walking behind camels, the real life of the, of the Middle East in the time of Jesus comes to life for you. Now, Mary, we're going to talk about her next. She also would, um, oh, let me do it this way. I would like to ask this question. The Holy Family had to live a mundane life. They did not walk three feet off the ground. Yes, they were holy people. Yes, they were righteous. The only one adjective used of Joseph, Joseph never says a word that we hear him speak in the Gospels. And there's only one adjective that's used about Joseph. It says that he was a righteous or a just man. 
And when the angel came, by the way, the book of Matthew is Joseph's side of the story. If you want to read about the nativity and the beginnings of the gospel, you want to hear Joseph's side, you read Matthew. If you want to hear Mary's side of the story, you read Luke. And Luke, Mary had an apparition of an angel. Mary came to the angel and talk to her and Mary asked how will this be and so on the angel came to Joseph three times never says in Matthew about the angel coming to him but the angel came to Joseph three times and every time Joseph you never have any conversation with the angel he just did what the angel told him to do so Joseph and Mary lived a very rustic life they were very righteous they obeyed the law better than anybody else and Jesus too in Galatians 4 4 it says that in the fullness of time God sent his son born of a woman born under the law meaning that they would have been very strict Jews now most people don't think of Jesus when on his daily life or at least on the Sabbath looking like this but I think that's exactly what Jesus looked like with his prayer shawls and the teflum on his forehead where they put the prayers. The Jews did that, and we know that from the Gospels. And I bet you that's what Jesus and Joseph looked like on the Sabbath. And most of the time, people never think of Jesus like that. We have our own ideas of what he looked like. But if you go back in time, it's uh, uh, interesting for me to see them the way they were. I'm going to close because my time for this segment's over, but I'm just going to ask one question. When... Um, what is more spiritual, to pray the rosary or to change a dirty diaper? Or you call them nappies, if I remember right, in Ireland. To pray the rosary or to change a smelly nappy? Well, most people would immediately say changing a dirty diaper is a mundane, earthy thing to do, but praying the rosary is more spiritual. But I would think that Mary would contradict you there, and so would Mother Teresa. Mary, if you asked her in her daily life with all the manual, mundane uh, tasks and chores that she had to do every day to take care of the family. What is more spiritual? And Mary would say, the th most spiritual thing you can do at any moment in time is to do exactly what my son wants you to be doing at that moment in time. And with the baby, with his dirty nappies, what my son would want you to do right now is to go change those nappies and clean up the little baby. That's the most spiritual thing you can do right now. And then take the baby to with you to prayer. The Holy Family teaches us, and I'll close with this, and the Catechism says this, and, and uh, Pope Paul VI said this when he was in Israel, and I like to quote him, that the family, Holy Family teaches us in their daily life the importance of silence, and being quiet like they were in that village with their eyes on God, taking care of their neighbor and their family and doing the tasks they needed to do. Second of all, it teaches us the dignity of family life, of a family together, loving each other under the Lordship of Jesus Christ and doing all that's necessary for the family and making that a priority. And it's also the importance of hard work. Joseph and Jesus were hidden away from the world for those 30 years while they were working and chipping away at rocks. And they taught us the dignity of work as well. That's just a little idea there of the daily life in the Holy Family. And I think there's going to be a question or two and some music. And then I'll come back and we'll talk about Mary, the real girl and the woman of mystery. Thanks, Mill, Steve. That was uh, very insightful. And I'm sure a lot of those insights you'd have got from actually visiting the Holy Land. So I'm sure you'd recommend uh, people to take a, a pilgrimage and do visit the Holy Land. All of these uh, insights will become more obvious, I think, if you were to visit that area. So um, something I'm look, looking forward to do it. I know you bring a, a lot of people out to that um, on pilgrimage there. So something on my to-do list to go with you sometime to the Holy Land. Um, a few questions in, maybe if you, if you want to go first. Yeah, so we have a question here, which is, um, if a person was looking to come to know and understand the Holy Family, maybe on a deeper level, would you have any tips or advice for that person? I would read and meditate on scripture. I would get books or articles about life in the Holy Land in the first century. And I think the best source possible is the scriptures themselves especially the gospels but also the old testament because abraham isaac and jacob they were they were nomadic you know people think that all the the pictures we see that they had all their teeth <laughs> you think of even of joseph and of the apostles as having all of their teeth they're 
pretty pearly whites like ours. But in reality, you go over there today and you go out and to see the Bedouins, half of their teeth are gone. I mean, this was this is the thing that if you want to understand the Holy Family better and what life was like and who they really were, to read the scriptures, to put yourself in imagination back 2000 years ago in a land that did not have dentists and things that we take for granted. And what would life have been like? They didn't have any mosquito spray to keep the bugs off you. And when you go over there today and you go down in the Jordan Valley, uh, you're just covered with biting flies. Um, and I would also say, read anything you can about the first century and life in that land. And probably the most important thing you could do is to go there because to walk in that land makes it so real. That's why I think I just have a palpable sense of the Holy Family and their life because I've walked on those paths and been in those caves so many times, even out into the country part where I've gone out to visit the Bedouins or in my movies, I've done a lot of filming in those Bedouin camps to get a feel for what it was like for these people. But, I, I, and also my movies on Mary and Jesus and the others I make, I, I really bring out their real life and what it was like to live there, but that maybe that can help you get started. One of the frustrations of doing this talk is that normally, this talk is two hours long. I've even done up to four hours with a group of seminarians because to talk about Mary is a rich topic. But I have 20 minutes, so I'm gonna just dive right in. And the talk title is normally Real Girl and Woman of Mystery, two sides of the same coin. If you look at artwork of Mary, she's very beautiful. There's not a stain on her. We discussed this in the earlier talk. She's a, a beautiful knot, her feet are clean. Everything is just a mat. And oftentimes she looks like she's from Sweden. And this, I understand why artists portray, uh, portray her this way because they are trying to emphasize her holiness, her immaculate conception, the queen of heaven, the sinlessness and so on. And that is all fine and good. But if you would have met Mary on the street or on the pathways, I should say, of Nazareth 2000 years ago, she would not look like that. She would look very different, a very rustic, tough girl with dark skin, dark eyes. In fact, in the Church of the Annunciation in Nazareth, they have put together the Christians there, the Palestinian Christians who have lived there for uh, hundreds, even thousands of years, have made a beautiful statue of Mary called Our Lady of Nazareth. And you see her pregnant and she has dark hair. She has gentle features, but it's dark skin, not like uh, European, but very much like a Middle Eastern girl and probably around 15 years old. But I learned, I'm coming at this as a Catholic with you, but I had spent the first 38, nine years of my first 39 years of my life as an evangelical Protestant, very opposed to the Catholic Church and not interested in Mary at all, because I thought the Catholics made way too much of her. They worshiped her and they made her the fourth person of the Trinity. And I had all the exaggerations in my mind of what Catholics did. I learned more about Mary in my conversion process. I learned more about Mary from the Old Testament than I did from the New Testament. The New Testament does not tell us much about Mary. But if you understand how to read the Old Testament the way the, doc the fathers and the doctors of the church did, you will see Mary is all over the Old Testament. For example, even in Genesis 3.15, when the promise is made after the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden that a woman is going to come in her son. There's going to be a war between them and the devil. And already in, John, in Genesis chapter 315, we see Mary mentioned, not by name, but as the woman and her seed. And there's going to be a warfare with Satan. And that's all played out again in Revelation chapter 12, by the way, if you want to see that. And even the same terms are used, even this as the devil from the garden, from the ancient garden of Eden. So Mary is that woman who's going to do battle with Satan. We see in Isaiah 7, 14, that she's going to be a virgin who gives birth. She's going to be the Ark of the New Covenant. She is the new burning bush. I don't have time to go in and describe all of these. I have a separate talk on that. Why Mary is the burning bush. It's called typology. And she is that Ark of the New Covenant, the burning bush. She is also the uh, cloud of Elijah. She's the daughter of Zion. She's the new Eve in a new garden and by the way, all of these are referring to Mary. And if you have time, it is a fantastic, I've got articles on my website about it. 
catholicconvert.com, by the way, is my website, catholicconvert.com. And if you go to the resources, I've got lots of articles about Mary, all kinds of different aspects. Do we worship here? Uh, how is she the Ark of the New Covenant and typology and all of that? But I got to skip over that Old Testament part. And I want to come to the place where Mary was born. She was born in Jerusalem. That's the ancient tradition. There's a church just a stone's throw away from the temple, which is called St. Anne's Church. And it was uh, built very early on. And it's still their beautiful church today. Um, and if you go in, you see a statue there of Anne and Mary and their uh, grandmother. So it's a beautiful image of Grandma Anne and then Mary. And it's a beautiful, beautiful image of Mary. That's one of the things people don't realize that Jesus had grandparents. You don't think of that, but he, they did, he did. He had grandparents on Mary's side. And you see a sign that says the nativity of Our Lady, and you go down to the grotto below, and ancient tradition says that in that cave is where the Blessed Virgin Mary was, was born. And one of the things that we learn about this, and the angel makes mention of it at the Annunciation, is this is where we have the uh, immaculate conception. Mary was conceived immaculately, immaculate conception. Now, when I was a Protestant, I used to, uh, throughout this talk and all the different, normally what I do is we start in Jerusalem where she's born, then Nazareth, and we follow her geographically and bring in all the doctrines of the church. I don't have the time to do that today like I normally would. But there in Jerusalem is where the immaculate conception took place. And the way I, in my movie, no, let's put it this way. When I was a Protestant, I used to trip Catholics up about this. I used to have all the questions to trip up a Catholic about Mary. I would say, so you Catholics believe that Mary was conceived without original sin, right? And they all say, yeah. I said, are you sure? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, we do. We believe it. And that she never sinned during her life, right? Right, yeah, we believe that. Okay, I said, I want you to finish a verse for me. In, at the visitation, Mary says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Mary says, my soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit, and the group says, rejoices in God, my Savior. And I said, oops, did you just, Mary just say she needed a Savior? Mary says that God was her Savior. Who needs a Savior but a sinner? Mary must have been a sinner if she needed a Savior. And usually the poor Catholics, they don't know what to say. They just, they would just go silent. Did Mary need a Savior? even though she was immaculately conceived. Yes, she did, of course, because she was a daughter of Eve. She was subject to sin just like everybody else. But by a unique act of God, based on the merits of her son, she was preserved from the stain of original sin and given the grace to refuse sin the rest of her life. And here's how I explain the fact that she needs a savior. In my movie, I told you I have a movie called Mary, Mother of God, and I have a pathway and I built a big mud puddle with a log in front of it. And as I'm walking along, I trip over the log and I fall into the mud puddle and my face is just all covered with mud. And I say the first way to be saved from a puddle of mud is to be pulled out and cleaned up, washed off. Then I come back again at the mud puddle and I trip on the log again. And right before I fall in, a hand stops and pushes me back. And I say to the camera, the second way to be saved from a puddle of mud is to be prevented from falling in in the first place. Mary needed a savior. She was saved from the puddle of sin by a unique act of God by preventing her from coming in. So yes, Mary did need a savior. Now, the, when the angel came to Mary, and we're going to move ahead now to Mary is, uh, we don't, this isn't in the Bible, but it's understood. And we have feast days for these things. How do we know the name of Mary's parents, Joachim and Anna? They come from a document called the Proto-Evangelium of James, early second century. How do we know that Mary was consecrated to the temple? Same document. We even pray and talk about Mary's presentation. We have a feast day for this. So Mary, at, it was a miraculous baby in the sense that she came from old parents who couldn't have kids. This document is very interesting, tells that story, how uh, Joachim went out into the desert and prayed for 40 days, said, I'm not going home until you answer my prayer. And uh, Anna was in the garden and she saw the birds in the trees having babies with their nests and the eggs. And she said to God, why is it that the birds can have the babies in the nest, but you don't give me a child? And the angel came and said, you'll have a daughter. And that daughter was Mary. And so when... Elizabeth, Anne, I'm sorry, Anne is Elizabeth did it, it was John the Baptist, but when Anne gave birth, she had promised God that she would dedicate 
Mary to the temple. So at three years old, because they breastfed their babies for three years, they didn't wean babies for three years in those days. They, so you took her to the temple and Mary served in the temple as a young girl. She was sewing things and making things there. And about 10, 12 years old, when the menstrual cycle would kick in, she was, then they moved to Nazareth. That's, that's the way I understand it. And I put it together in my movie. Now, Mary lived there in a cave with her mom and dad. And one day she goes to get water with the well. She's got the jugs on her head. And she's on her way very much like this. I showed you this picture to begin with, with the jugs on their head and the girls still go to the well, even a hundred years ago. Look at their feet too, by the way. That's, I mean, I just so intrigued by that, the real Mary. And she went one day, probably at 14 or 15 years old. And when I'm with my groups, and I always have kids with us because it's, we don't have just older people. We have a lot of families come with us to the Holy Land. And I asked the girls in the group, do you think Mary liked going to the well every day, 15 minutes with that jug on her head, getting two or three gallons of water and bringing that. Do you think she liked that chore every morning and evening? And the girls all say, no, she wouldn't have liked it. And I said, well, let me tell you, ask you this, who else was at the well? All the other girls were there from the village. They didn't have texting and Facebook and Twitter and all those things. They went to the well where they could talk and share all their stories and giggle together. And then they'd come back with the water. One day, I think what happened and the Greek Orthodox tradition says that the angel came to Mary at the well and she was afraid and ran home. And that's why the angel, when he gets to back to her cave says, do not be afraid. But I think I, I picked the story up when Mary comes back. I, this is the way I envision it. She's got, a, it's maybe muddy by the way, and it rains a lot in Nazareth. I was there one time, it rained five inches. And I think that many times when Mary came back, it sounded like this, <laughs> as she's slogging through the mud. And she gets to the cave and she sets the jug down inside the cave. And I know right where that cave is because we show it to our group when we're there. And I think that the entrance to the cave went dark. And Mary said, mother, someone's blocking the entrance to the cave. And she goes back outside. And there at the entrance of the cave is an archangel named Gabriel. Now, I have never seen an archangel myself, and I doubt that any of you have. I don't know that I want to see an archangel this side of heaven, because every time we hear of people seeing angels, they fall on their face as though they're dead, many, many times anyway. And the angel, we always see the angel like, greeting Mary, but I don't think so. I think the angel had his head to the ground with his wings were down, and very slowly he came up and he said, hail, full of grace. That's not what he said. He said, hail, kahare, tomene. You want to know what I'm talking about right there. You can see the Greek word, kahare, tomene. And that Greek word is a very intense, pregnant word, no pun intended, packed word, because that word kahare, tomene means it is a past tense and a present tense. And it means one who has been made full of grace and who continues to be in that state full of grace at this moment. In other words, that is one of the seeds of our understanding of the Immaculate Conception, God's name for Mary. John Paul II said that Mary's name in the eyes of God is Kahare Tomene, the one who I made full of grace and who still remains full of grace at this moment. That means that Mary's full of the life of God. That's what grace is. And if she's full of the life of God, that means that there can be no sin or evil in her. She's full of grace, full of the life of God. And Mary then went back into the cave. But can you imagine, for me, the most poignant verse in the Annunciation is the last verse. Mary says, do it unto me according to your will. And she gives her fiat, yes, she'll do this. But the last verse is so significant to me because it says, and then the angel left her. What does that mean, the angel left her? Just think, Mary's a 15-year-old girl, just got this an incredible announcement. How do you process something like that? I think I'd have gone in and said, mom. But when Aunt Mary said yes, do you realize that it could have been a very a moment of sorrow for Mary, not only of great jubilation and joy that she's going to give birth to the Messiah, who's going to be the first king in Israel for over 600 years, the first king, he's going to sit on the throne of his father, David, be the first king in over 600 years in Israel. And so she is trying to process this. 
and she's happy about it. But it's also, I think, a moment of sorrow because for the Jewish people to be pregnant out of wedlock, and in fact, in, in Nazareth today, no girl gets pregnant out of wedlock because it's such a scandal. Families are so involved, big families, that girls just don't do that. It doesn't happen there like it does here in the United States. And so I think if, if I were Mary, I would have said, by the way, to the angel, dear angel, I will accept this mission from God, but would you please tell everybody else in Nazareth what you what you just told me so that they'll know what happened? Because Joseph and I, we are betrothed, but we're not married yet. And, I, and I've pledged virginity. We know that, that that's the case with Mary. And so how could I be pregnant? And people are going to be pointing fingers and there's going to be gossip. And in the old days in Israel, a woman that got pregnant out of wedlock like that was taken out and stoned killed. So this was probably a moment of sorrow. Can you please tell everybody else what you just told me, Angel? There's another moment of sorrow that we don't think about with Mary too. I'm just running out of time. Is in Cana where she uh, tells Jesus to ask him to do a miracle. But remember, she didn't even ask him to do the miracle. Jesus said, woman, this, what do I have to do with this to do with you and me? And my hour hasn't come yet. So Jesus basically said, no, I, I can't do that now he knew she was asking for a miracle and Mary just ignored Jesus. And she turned to the servants and says, you guys do whatever he tells you. And she walked away back to the women and the, and the weddings, by the way, are separated between men and women. And so Jesus was over with the guys and Mary was over with the women. She came over, got his attention to get, do whatever he tells you. She said, and walks away and Jesus did the miracle. But I think also when Mary said, do whatever he tells you, she said that again, with tears running down her eyes. And why do I say that? Because when Mary said, do whatever he tells you, she knew that Jesus was going to do a miracle. He would then be recognized as somebody special. He would be recognized. And it even says in verse 11 that his disciples saw the miracle and they beheld his glory. And from that moment on, Jesus not, didn't go back to his cave with his mother. Jesus went out to serve his heavenly father. And so what I mean by that is Mary's now going to stand in the cave looking up over the hillside and Jesus isn't going to come home for work anymore. He's going to be out serving his father. And when Mary said, do whatever he tells you, what she really said was, goodbye, my son. I'm going to miss you every day. The prayers together, eating together, but it's now time for you to go serve your heavenly father. And in a way, Mary gave him away to us. Well, Mary goes to visit Elizabeth after she finds out, oh my goodness, I have only three more minutes left. Mary goes to visit Elizabeth at the visitation and in the visitation, we see so much about Mary. Luke is brilliant in the way he writes this. It's all embedded with the Old Testament. First of all, Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant. I got to just cut to the chase. I can't do it like I normally would bringing you along. Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant. And in the Ark of the Old Covenant, there was the word of God inscribed in stone, the manna which came down from heaven in the wilderness, and a stick which proved the priesthood of Aaron. In the book of Hebrews, we find out those three things are in the Ark of the Covenant. Now, Mary, as the new Ark of the Covenant, she's going to visit Elizabeth and what is in her womb. In Mary's womb, as the Ark of the New Covenant, she has not the word of God inscribed in stone, but in her is the word of God inscribed in flesh. In her is not manna which came down from the wilderness, that if you eat of it, you will die. But in Mary's womb is the bread of life which came down from heaven that if you eat of it, you will never die. And in Mary's womb is not the stick which proved a priesthood of Aaron. In Mary's womb is the priest. And when, Mary, when the angel of the Lord said to Mary at her uh, announcement back in, in uh, Luke chapter one, that, uh, that you will... How is this going to happen to me? He said, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And as soon as Mary heard that, I know that she thought in her mind of the book of Exodus chapter 40. Go look at the end of Exodus 40, where when Moses finished completing the Ark of the Covenant, that very special thing that nobody was even allowed to touch. It was so holy that it says the Holy Spirit of God overshadowed the Ark. Mary is going to have the Holy Spirit of God overshadow her, the Ark of the New Covenant. And then in Luke's visitation, it says that Mary was there for three months. Everybody in the house was blessed. Elizabeth said, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? 
Mary stayed there three months. What happened in the Old Testament? Second Samuel chapter six, look it up. Second Samuel chapter six, David brings the Ark of the Covenant into the hill country of Judea. Mary goes to the hill country of Judea. David dances and leaps in front of the Ark. John the Baptist leaps in his mother's womb in front of the Ark. David said, who am I that the ark of the Lord should come to me? Elizabeth said, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? The ark of the covenant stayed in the hill country of Judea with David for three months. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months. David, it says that the house where the ark was left was blessed. And the word blessed is used two or three times in Mary in the visitation. But I have to quit now because the time is up. But I would hoping that we could get to heaven all the way there where Mary, we see her the queen of heaven and the... Uh, the assumption of Mary. I just give you one hint there what's going on. And again, I said, I learned more about Mary from the Old Testament than I did from the New. In the book of 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 19, you may want to look that up too. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 19, Solomon, who was the son of David, Jesus is also referred to, remember, as the son of David. It's a messianic title. And Solomon, the first thing he does as king, his mother walks into the throne room. And you know, you guys live in a kingdom, or you have lived in a kingdom. I know a whole complicated history there but there in kingdoms you don't walk into the queen or the king's throne room unsummoned and and solomon's mother walked in and solomon got up off of his throne he bowed to the ground he prostrated himself in front of his mother and when he sat back on his throne he built another throne at his right hand and he brought his mother he assumed her up and put her in that throne next to him and whereas in the morning there was only one throne there from then on through all of israelite history there were two thrones and the mother of the king always ruled with him and she was an intercessor for the people. Ding, 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 ding. Does that ring a bell? And so Mary was taken up into heaven and she was seated at the right hand of the son of David, the new son of David, Jesus Christ, who raised his mother up and seated her at his right hand. Why? Because he was a good Jewish son. And he knew that Jews, Jewish kings do what Jewish kings do. And what do Jewish kings do? They raise their mothers up to be seated at their right hand to rule in the kingdom with them. Anyway, that's as much time as I have. I'm out of time. I wish I could go on and on, but maybe someday I'll get back to Ireland. I've been there many times with groups and for speaking conferences and so on. I hope to get back again soon and maybe we'll do the longer version then. And in the meantime, God bless you all. And in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Lord, bless us all and bless these folks in their conference in Ireland. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, please, God, we will ha definitely have to get you either here in person or back on again, just to give us the, the fuller talks there. You've definitely got our appetite and the phones here are, are hopping. Unfortunately, we can't get to all of the messages and, qu and questions and comments that have come in. But uh, we're here with our priest director, Father Eamon. And Father Eamon, uh, he was telling me that he has all of your resources as well. So something he probably used a lot. A lot so I'll hand it now over Indeed, to Father. Steve, thanks for those wonderful talks. Way too short, way too short. Uh, well, been, thank you. I have been using Father, I had... Mm -hmm. Didn't know what to say and what to leave out. But if people go to my website, catholicconvert.com, there's a lot of things there. And um, you can ask me questions too if, if, uh, if they want to through that site. But um, I can't probably have time to answer all of them, but we'll see what we can do. Or maybe you can send me the questions, Aiden. Maybe that's a better way to do it. And I'll see what I can do. That's great. That would work too. So catholicconvert.com. So listen, Steve, uh, every grace and blessing upon your tremendous ministry. You've been a tremendous uh, example to many and your story continues, I'm sure, to animate and guide and bless and encourage people on the journey across the Tiber. So delighted to have you with us this afternoon. We're so, so grateful. And thank God you for being you. a priest, by the way. Thank you too. And uh, thank you for being a dad and a granddad. <laughs> So well done. God bless you, Steve. We do look forward to speaking with you again. Please, God. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Thanks, Steve. God bless you.